We are delighted to have a record number of people for this adventure in Italian opera with Fred Plotkin, and of course, uh, the, the, the guest of Fred tonight justifies these numbers and the excitement and the joy that is in the uh, auditorium and that you feel you can touch, I can tell you. And uh, when we do these things, uh, I always have to find something new to tell you about Fred. As you know, this is the eighth year of Adventures in Italian Opera with Fred Plotkin. Basically, we have provided some 80 classes, lessons, lectures. It's an entire course on opera that Fred is providing an ongoing course for those of you who have the fortune to sit through all of them. And if you didn't have the fortune to be here, you can go on Vimeo. We have a dedicated channel on which you will be able to see the recordings of the previous um, encounters of Fred. Um, and today I just want to invite you to read Fred's last article in his blog on WQXR that is dedicated not to an opera singer or to a conductor, but to one of the greatest film directors of all time, that is Fellini. Yes. Federico Fellini. Fred knew Fellini personally, and of course he's able to um, create a precious, refined, parallel between Fellini and opera. And it's something that is not being studied, it's not being discussed much, and Fred, with his usual perceptiveness, opens new frontiers in the better understanding of Fellini as an operatic director. So when you go home from here, read Fred's article on Federico Fellini. And without further ado, it's now my great pleasure to ask you to welcome Fred Plotkin and Roberto Alagna. Who is that? <laughs> Do I need to introduce Roberto Alagna? Um, I have my list of the artists that I want to do in this series while I'm still standing. And very high on my list for a long time has been Roberto Alagna. And we began a conversation by email quite a while ago. And I'm thrilled. We were down to two dates and it was a question of programming. And all I can say is I'm very, very happy he's here. He is one of the most beloved artists that we have. When I have told people that he would be appearing here tonight, the response always was, I love Roberto Alagna. <laughs> I love him. I love him. I love him. Okay, okay. I love him. No, really, I love him. And we do love Roberto Alagna. Thank you very much. So I think what I'd just like to do is talk to Roberto Alagna and have you discover the artistry you know but also some of the artistry you may not have yet encountered. So please welcome Roberto Alagna. Thank you very much. It's better to, to live here? As you wish. We'll see. Well, I will try like Maybe this. Not. Does that stay? Yes. So those of you who come here all the time, there's something new. <laughs> That's what you look like. It looks smart. <laughs> so, what I would like to do, the microphone, is it on? Is One, it on? Yeah. Okay. It works. Okay. The, the sound here is unimpeachable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I would like to do is start by showing you... Uh, a little bit of film of Roberto talking. It'll be up here, and then we'll talk about it after. So, if you please. We have to move? Okay. Just there. 
Luciano était convaincu qu'une voix d'opéra est comme une fleur sauvage qui peut pousser n'importe où. On n'est pas obligé d'aller la chercher dans les conservatoires ou les écoles de chant. Un jour, à Paris, Luciano Pavarotti voit s'approcher un jeune garçon qui dit vouloir chanter. Luciano lui dit de lui écrire et après un an d'attente, Roberto Alagna reçoit la convocation du maître. Euh, je me souviens, lorsque je suis arrivé, au départ, je suis arrivé au concours avec des airs très dramatiques. Et donc, euh, lui m'a dit, oh là là, tu, il m'a dit, tu fais les aigus comme si tu, tu tirais au pistolet. Et, euh, et je ne sais pas si c'était un compliment ou un défaut, mais ensuite il m'a dit, voilà, ce répertoire, tu le chanteras plus tard. Pour le moment, il faut que tu chantes lyrique. Et des années plus tard, 20 ou 20, 20 ans plus tard, il était en train de faire un concert à, à San Francisco. Et il m'invite et je le retrouve dans sa loge. C'est à Los Angeles, pardon. Los Angeles, je chantais, chantais Payas avec Placido qui me dirigeait. Et il m'a dit, tu vois, que tu y es arrivé à ce répertoire. Donc il n'avait pas oublié une phrase qu'il m'avait dite euh, 20 ans avant dans ce concours. Après les débuts d'Alania, les deux ténors se rencontreront sur scène comme lors de cet anniversaire improvisé. Vous savez, euh, moi j'ai toujours eu un tel respect que je n'ai jamais osé lui demander ni un conseil. Je n'ai même pas osé l'aborder, c'était toujours lui qui venait m'aborder. Je me souviens lorsque j'ai fait son concours, qui a duré deux ans, hein, donc j'aurais pu euh, vraiment euh, comment dire, me lier beaucoup plus euh, facilement à lui. Non, j'avais ce respect, pour moi c'était un demi-dieu et je le voyais comme une sorte de, de Bacchus, Poseidon ensemble. Et donc euh, je n'osais pas l'approcher. Je me souviens qu'à la fin des, des séances, tous les, les aspirants chanteurs allaient autour de lui, comme ça il y avait une sorte de, de foule autour de lui, et lui me regardait toujours de loin. Et mon père qui était là me disait, mais va le trouver, tu vois bien qu'il qu t'appelle du regard. Et moi je n'osais pas. Et un jour c'est lui qui a fendu la foule et qui m'a embrassé comme ça, avec, il m'a entouré de ses bras et il m'a dit, tu as une voix affascinante. So before we came down, Roberto and I were talking about our friend Luciano. Um, a lot of you know that Ron Howard did a documentary about him recently, and I was the opera advisor on the film and loved him. We were friends for 29 years. And you were telling me stories about you and Luciano, how mm -hmm. you met his influence in your life. So if you'd like to talk about him. Yeah, it's difficult to, to speak about God. <laughs> he was a real God for me, you know. He was so, so charming, so smart, but also uh, with something special. He was able to speak without words, just with eyes. It was amazing. And uh, he gave me a lot uh, because of his uh, uh, personality, but also this... Uh, Uh, instrument. It was a magical instrument. It was uh, like a Stradivario. It was something very special. I remember here at the Met, I was listening to him singing La Fille du Regiment, Andrea André Chénier, and the voice was like a mir miracle. It was amazing because the night after, it was possible to hear great tenors, but they were not the same <laughs> like him. It was very special. 
And um, I don't know, uh, it's impossible for me to forget Luciano because uh, even today, when sometimes I feel a little bit uh, sad or depressed, I put not um, a music uh, with, with uh, Luciano singing, not that, but speaking, you know, some interviews. And suddenly you have the smile again in your face, everything in your heart. This, this is the, the miracle of Luciano. It was so great singing, but it was also very great and special speaking and just because it was like this. You were telling me, we were talking about his, the end of Luciano's life and how I went to visit him in Modena and Roberto said that he called Luciano two days before he died. Mm -hmm. And what did you talk about? And what did he say to you? Yes, it was very strange because all the time, you know, he had some uh, punchline, you know, some, uh, <laughs> it was a, like an enigma. Yeah. He spoke like this. And uh, I remember I, I was very, very moved because I, I knew he was in, at the end of his life. And I said, Maestro, ti voglio bene. Yes, I, oh, Roberto, I love you too. And uh, he, I, he told me, non perderti straniero, ricorda le tre note. <laughs> Is that you know the phrase from Turandot? Yeah. Maybe you can translate that. Don't lose your way, foreigner, stranger. Remember the three notes. And after that, he died. And I was all the time during the night, you know, when uh, I was not able to sleep. This is my first de defect. I was thinking on this phrase. Why Luciano told me that? And I understood maybe uh, three years later. And I, I was, um, I remember that uh, uh, maybe 15 years uh, before, Luciano asked me to do, um, uh, you know, the, um, to speak about him in a do documentary. It was the side, uh, the pop side was uh, with Bono, and the lyrical side with me. And I remember when the, the, the interviewer asked me to speak about him, I said, you know, Luciano is very special because he has three perfect notes. Mi, fa, sol, <laughs> E, F, G. Mm -hmm. Those three notes in Luciano Pavarot are perfect. And I think in that moment, he wanted to, to thank me about that, but also to give me uh, some heritage of that, because he said, non perderti straniero, ricorda le tre note. Remember those three notes. It means you have those three notes too. Be careful not to lose that, you know? And I think, it was amazing to have this incredible singer, incredible uh, uh, human being speaking about that in that moment, you know, two days before dying. So um, when this production of La Boheme that you all know by Franco Zeffirelli was new at the Met on December 14th of 1981, that was the first new production I worked on at the Met, and it is the most performed in Met history. We all know it. I decided that when I left the Met, I would go out on that production in 1988 with Luciano, with Morella Franio, Thomas Hampson, Barbara Daniels, Kleiber conducting a wonderful cast. The same production in 1996, Roberto made his debut in, and we were all there. And you have just sung five performances as Rodolfo mm -hmm. in the same production quite a few yeah. years later, yeah. <laughs> very beautifully, very passionately. Thank you. <laughs> and I realized when I went the other night to see you that this was the first time I've seen a man from Paris play Rodolfo. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I was at home, yeah. But you know, the night the night after it was Traviata is the same. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I would like yeah. also because now speaking yeah. about La Bohème, I remember something funny about Luciano Pavarotti again. I was uh, making my debut here in Bohème, and uh, Luciano arrived in my dressing room. I was so so pleased and uh, very very surprised to to see him there. And he said, "You made a lot of road, you know." And I said, Maestro, piano piano. He said, piano piano, piano forte. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was funny. I was wondering, as a man from Paris, we'll talk a bit more about Paris in a moment, but playing a character from the city that you grew up in and know well, 
must be a little different. It's as if you grew up in Rome and played Mario Cavaradossi. What is the particular... You know, Mario Cavaradossi is uh, all French. Yes, I know that. Yes. (laughs) So that you could do it in either country. (laughs) But, I mean, here we have an opera that's by an Italian composer based on French stories from the 1830s, set in Paris, usually Mm -hmm. in the 1830s. The current production in Paris is actually set on the moon. I'm not kidding. A blah, blah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. The current production of Blah, Blah, Women in Paris is set on the moon. But in- again, you know, the first conductor who conducted yeah. my first CD yeah. was uh, Armstrong. Richard Armstrong. Richard Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> we are all the time. We have a relation with something. Yeah. <laughs> Even with the moon. <laughs> um, but when you are in that set, in that scenery by Zeffirelli, and the clothing yeah. is from paintings and all the scenery, say très parisienne. Yeah. How do you experience the role differently? It's, it's very strange because, in fact, uh, La Bohème, it's my life. But maybe also your life because it's about uh, youngness, it's about hope, it's about, uh, you know, uh, uh, studying, it's about, uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, joking about difficulties of life, everything, you know. This is... and. Uh, it, I was in, the, in that uh, situation too, but the most uh, uh, incredible, it's because you know, in La Bohème, at the end, there are young people and they meet death mm. at the end, and it's the end of the youngness. And I had the same in my life, when I, I became widow when I was 29, you know? And uh, even... <laughs> Opera is life. It is. Um, So, but in my preparation to speak to you, I met a challenge because I've always known you as Roberto (laughs) Alagna. But when I started looking at programming from France, Monsieur est Roberto (laughs) Alagna. And he's from Clichy Soubois. Clichy Soubois. And it seems to be an area that historically had Sicilians and Italians it's and Portuguese. It's worse than that because I was. <laughs> it's worse than that because I was born in Clichy sous Bois, and in Clichy sous Bois you don't have hospital, you don't have a clinic, mm. you don't have nothing. I was born in a garage. <laughs> Amazing, no? Because in that time it was difficult to find a house or something, and my, my parents were young. Uh, they came from Sicily uh, without money, nothing. And uh, uh, a friend of my father, who was uh, um, had the house and a small garage, and he said Ciccio because my father is Francesco. In Sicilian, in Sicilian they call him Ciccio. He said Ciccio, if you want, I can give you my garage. Try to to transform that in something. And my father, oh, thank you very much, you know. Mm-hmm. And he gave the, this garage, and my father made a small. Two, uh, two, two rooms there, and I, I born there with the, the, the my, the, the generalist, the doctor generalist, mm-hmm. you know? yeah. and uh, my, my grandmother was there, and even my uh, grand grandmother. Yeah, mm. I was there, and uh, I born in that time. I, I remember. Uh, no, I, I can't remember, but <laughs> <laughs> my parents told me they cried a lot because. Uh, the, the, they were afraid because uh, when uh, uh, I born, I didn't uh, cry. Speak, cry. Cry. Yeah. I said, oh my God, he will die, uh-huh. you know? But soon soon after that, I start to cry. <laughs> and when did you start singing? You were, did you cry I first in that moment. Right there, right there. <laughs> they put away the, the, the cordon, you know? <laughs> and when they put that away, I start to, to sing. <laughs> um, Julian, I'm going to ask you to set up number four, please. When you were growing up in France, no matter where you study or grow up, there was a lot of culture available in radio and television. It's it's wonderful that way. In many ways, France is wonderful. But one of them is the central role of culture in the life of every citizen. And did your family have television? Was it radio? <laughs> Was it recordings? Did they you had sit around? Nothing. nothing. That's yeah. the problem because, you know, yeah. in fact, it's, it's sure when you are in, in Paris, it's fantastic mm-hmm. for the culture. But we were not in Paris. Yeah. We were just out. 
And, uh, you know, with the small community of Sicilian people, mm -hmm. you know, in fact, when I arrived at school, uh, I was not uh, able to speak French because uh, in, in, in the family, everybody spoke uh, Sicilian. It was my first language. And I arrived there and I, I had to learn French. French. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember also, the, you know, when I, I asked my mom, well, it would be nice to go to the opera to, to listen to something. My, my mom was used to say, you know, noi siamo operai. We're workers. Noi siamo yeah. operai, we can't go there. It's too expensive. I said, okay. And the first time when I, I went to the opera, it was with me on stage, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I had not uh, no chance to, to, to see something live. And, but uh, but I, I was happy because, in fact, in my family, I had a lot of uh, wonderful voices, tenors, soprano. Uh, even my father was a good, a good singer. And my grandfather, my grand grandfather, who was here, a friend uh, of Caruso, you know. And uh, I remember my grand grandmother. I, I I was used to to hear the the, the, the stories of the family. You know, she uh, when she died, I I, I was uh, 20 years old. You know, and uh, I remember all those stories with Caruso. My grand grandfather, his name was Mr. Jimmy. He was born here and he died here, and he was tenor too. And uh, it, I think the, 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 the opera was in my blood. In, it was something, uh, uh, in fact, I was obliged to do something like this because otherwise, cosa uh, facciamo? <laughs> you can cook. <laughs> he I can, can cook, cook but uh, believe me. <laughs> um, I'm going to read something Roberto wrote in 2008. And apparently it's better without my glasses. Sunday dinner is coming to an end. I am seated to the left of my grandfather, and his son, Alberto, is on the right. My mother arrives carrying mandarins so sun-drenched that they exude the very essence of Sicily itself. I am over there in an instant. My father starts beating out a rhythm, tapping his fingers on the corner of the table. Then an extraordinary scene unfolds before my astonished eyes, one guitar, then another joins the waltz. A mandolin flutters like a butterfly, releasing a cascade of notes that metamorphose into a furious tarantella. I'm bewitched. An accordion, a Jew's harp, and a tambourine send me spiraling into another world. A fever of excitement seizes me. My uncle grabs a sort of amphora and spins it around over his head. He blows into it, and it becomes the ensemble's double bass. My father's voice soars miraculously. I stare at him, mesmerized. He has never seemed so handsome. These Sicilian songs reveal his soul, his true self. His voice is strong, clear, powerful, and disturbing. I am overcome by emotion, and I drift from consciousness. I am no longer in my Parisian suburb in this kitchen. I am under the spell of a divine parallel world. As usual, I am too shy to shout out. My heart is beating wildly. My blood is surging through my veins. I want to laugh, cry, yell, explode. I start to feel uneasy. All this chaos inside me, learn, observe, absorb, soak up the smallest inflections. That is what I must do. It will be my birthday in a few days' time, and I'm going to ask for a guitar. I will be eight years old. <laughs> Which only proves he also could have been a writer. Huh? I wrote two books. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was the experience in family life. You were surrounded by music. It was my school. Yeah. It was my school, and um, I think it, everything was there, you know? And uh, it was fantastic for, for me. To, to, to be like a sponge, you know, and to, to catch everything. And, be, and uh, I remember I was in love with the, this, uh, this, uh, this um, band, you know, my father, uncle, everybody's uh, singing, playing, accordion, everything. This, this uh, you know, amph amphora was mm -hmm. amazing, you know. You know that? In Sicily, they do with that, you know, they have a big amphora like this, and they do, <laughs> and the sound is amazing, you know, it goes to, to your heart directly. It was fantastic. I, I think I was lucky to be poor, but in the same time, rich. So I did not even think to ask you this, but what did you eat at home? What was Molto it? Molto pasta. Molto pasta. 
so it's more Italian, Sicilian <laughs> food. All the time, it's okay. Sicilian. You know, I know Maestro Coppola. You know Maestro yeah. Coppola, the, the, the grand uncle. Anton Anton Coppola. Coppola. Yeah. And he will turn this year 103 years old. In March, you know? March 20th. And he knew my family yeah. from yeah. America, my grand grandfather. And all, all the time I, I said, Maestro, what is the secret for your longevity? And he said, pasta e fagioli. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned that your grandfather knew Caruso, liked yeah. Caruso. Yeah. Roberto just came out with a recording. You know I'm not in the publicity business, but it's a wonderful recording that I just got. It's brand new, called Caruso 1873. What's the story of this recording? Why? What did it's, you want to say? It's the, the story of my life from, from the beginning because of my grand-grandmother. Uh, speaking about Caruso, mm -hmm. because uh, when I arrived here for the first time in America, my grandmother, the, 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 the daughter of Mr. Jimmy, said to me, you have to find the house. It's very important. And you must do the picture because I want to see this house. I've never been there. And I want, before I die, to see where my mom and my dad were in America. And she told me, it's very easy to find. It's, it, it, the, the, the place was in Chitiuk. I said, but <laughs> where is this uh, Chitiuk? <laughs> it's very easy. From our um, window, we were able to, sp to call the, the, the children playing in the park. And in front, we had the Brooklyn Bridge. Ah, OK. And Chiti was city all. <laughs> because. <laughs> City became Chiti and mm. hold, 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 hook, Chiti hook. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks God, I found everything. I made also a documentary for, for the French television. And my grandmother was in tears after that because mm. she saw everything. And uh, it was a beautiful moment, you know, to find that. I want to play something that I think you'll find unexpected from the Caruso CD. It's Roberto singing from La Boheme. <laughs> Julian, if you please. So, how many of you in the hall attended La Boheme recently? And how many of you heard him sing that? <laughs> I don't want to change the tessitura. Eh? No, no. It's just a tribute to Caruso because Caruso 
uh, in the, um, the story, uh, they said that uh, in the, the bass was uh, not well at the end of the opera to sing this, uh, this aria. And he sang at the Met instead of the, te the, the bass. And nobody saw the difference. Mm -hmm. But amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. And for this reason, I, I put on the CD because I think it's a wonderful tribute to do. Uh, it is uh, indeed. And I re it's a, as I discovered, because I went and, and I have a lot of Roberto's DVDs, I didn't have many CDs, so I went and bought a bunch. The program notes in your CDs are just the best that I've read by any artist in a very long time. And you come to really understand his relationship to the music, which makes my conversation very easy tonight because he wrote it all before. Yeah, um, and I, I, I have a lot of anecdotes with Caruso, mm -hmm. you, because uh, for many years I heard a lot of things. I have one amazing one, and nobody knows that because my grandmother told me this story. It was a, a night when, when Caruso sang at the Met Rigoletto, you know? And he broke a note during the, the show, and he was very upset. And uh, at the end of the show, he was in the dressing room. My grand grandmother and, and the, the, the husband were there, and they, they were very in the, in, the, in the corner, you know, not to disturb the maestro. The commendatore was not the maestro, it was mm -hmm. commendatore, <laughs> Caruso. And uh, a gentleman came to congratulate him, and he, he was very cold with uh, this man, Caruso, because he didn't recognize him. And my grandmother told me we were a little bit uh, ashamed because it was a Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> 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 he didn't recognize him. <laughs> Julian, please set up number five. And while we're doing that, in the meantime, I want to tell you something about Caruso. Um, as a lot of you know, I write cookbooks in addition to working in opera. And I like to do research on recipes relating to opera to different composers. And by the way, today, January 27th, is the anniversary of the death of my hero, Giuseppe Verdi, who was a great cook. And every opera singer, every conductor practically has a food tradition, whether it's what they grew up with, that's why I asked Roberto, what did you eat in the house, um, or ritual. So for example, Beverly Sills, always at a steak at four o'clock, boneless, but always a steak at four o'clock before she performed in the evening. Many singers do not eat before a performance. Caruso, if he sang in the evening, at 12.30 made the same dish all the time. And there was a trattoria near the old Met on 39th Street and they would make it for him. It was called Spaghetti Caruso and it was thick spaghetti, not thin, with tomato sauce made of chopped tomatoes, he was from Campania. Fegatini, chicken livers, uh. were the secret ingredient, and he felt that the iron in the chicken livers would give him the strength to perform that night. And acid reflux, I would guess. <laughs> but the other additional ingredient, because he wanted a lot of iron and strength, was he would saute spinach, and have it chopped up very fine and tossed at the end with the fegatini and the tomato and the spaghetti. This is what he ate before every performance. Yes, it's a pity because he died very young with this. Uh, I know. <laughs> it was better to eat the uh, pasta fagioli. Too much, <laughs> too much cholesterol. <laughs> so, Julian, <laughs> please play number five. Um, it's another Parisian character by Puccini with your wife, Alexandra Kurchak. And it's a wonderful, and I believe, underappreciated opera by Puccini. So if you please.
by me. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that because you know normally you have the duet is is continuing. You know? It's a scene, and uh, for the CD, I compose myself. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, I'm going to ask you to set up number six and then number seven. We'll watch one and then the other. Um, so, Il Tabaro, the cloak, you do not play the bad guy. You play the good guy or the tenor. Um, and Alexandra plays Giorgetta. And these are people living on a barge in the Seine River. And... Part of why I selected it is because, as you said, you come from a working family background. Mm -hmm. These are very much working class characters. Yeah. And I find it interesting in Puccini, but not only, how many working people yes. there not are, people. not kings, mm -hmm. not gods, not no. gods, <laughs> but working people and people you may have known in the, in yeah. the streets of Paris. I, this, I think for this reason, uh, Puccini moved. Yeah. Everybody, because yeah. we are, they are sto simple stories of mm -hmm. simple people. And this is, I think, amazing to have such a wonderful music just in simple stories, you know. And uh, I would like to tell you a small anecdote mm -hmm. about the Tabarro, because when I was young, my first CD recording was with Mirella Freni. Uh, in fact, it, it was a project for Luciano Pavarotti. And uh, after studying the, the, the part, Luciano said, oh, it's too difficult for me. I, I don't have... I don't, I don't want to learn that. It was uh, Gianni Schicchi and uh, Luigi in Tabarro. It was a triptico. And uh, Mirella Freni called me to sing uh, Rinuccio in Gianni Schicchi and uh, Giacomini, the great Giacomini, to do Tabarro, Luigi. And uh, during the, the recording session, I was there, you know, trying to steal something from, from uh, Giacomini, the great tenor. I said, I was so in love with his voice. And I was there, I said, okay, when he will finish to record, I will ask some advices, you know? Okay, and the, he finished the, the, the record, I, I came to him and he, oh, thank you to come, he told me, Roberto, because I would like to ask you, how do you put your voice in the mask like this? <laughs> <laughs> Quite funny. <laughs> so after hearing Roberto play French characters, we're moving to Italy, and we're going to see now two videos. One of them is a half French, half Italian character, Mario Cavaradossi, and then the other one is Sicilian and um, Cavalli Rusticana. And we're going to talk about that after, but I want in the Sicily one, which is very recent, it's from a production in Barcelona last month, mm -hmm. um, note oh, the woman playing Mama Lucia whose name is Elena Zilio, because she's really very, very special, I oh, think. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to watch voice. two videos, and then we'll go back. <laughs>
It's good sometimes to have some uh, pirate. Eh? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> are you left-handed? Sure. Oh, you are left-handed. For the for the for That's the scene, because thinking. otherwise I know this profile not good. I, know. <laughs> I understood that, but I wanted you to say it. Uh, <laughs> You have all the time to think about the audience. Exactly. <laughs> but that's really part of the next point I want to get to. And Julian, please set up number eight. Um, Roberto is an outstanding actor. And a lot of times, good operatic acting is doing less and not doing more. And I picked these two examples and put them together because every moment was specific. You knew in the Tosca aria that we've all heard a hundred times, if not a thousand, that he is saying goodbye to the woman he loves. He doesn't think he will see her again. And he's writing her a letter. And he's given the one piece of jewelry he has to the jailer in the hopes that this will be communicated to Tosca. And it's a reflection over his whole life. And I've seen many tenors really overact and it's a very internal moment and you play it internally it's and it, it's more effective you know when you are young you want to put more and more and more and more everything longer if you you go to the youtube you have some, my first uh, uh, tosca and you know it was a i tried to do like corelli you know very long phrase with the <laughs> and the piano everything but when you go uh, and you you became uh, more mature. You want to do simple, simple because in fact it's more real. For example, in this area, all the time you know with this very tragical music, we are very sad and very. Um, you see, everything is uh, uh, chiuso, you mm -hmm. know, in closed side, in, in, closed in. But here at the beginning, he's remembering beautiful moments of happiness with her. For this. Even if I am in, in bad shape, you know, <laughs> but I try to smile a bit because he's remembering she came to me. It was the beautiful stars on the sun and she, mm -hmm. she embraced me. She came to and it's very beautiful. And this detail is very important to start the aria with a small smile. Because mm -hmm. of that and piano, piano, he goes to the tragedy and to this uh, uh, addio alla vita. This is important to have some yeah. details. Even here, you know, with the mom, you know, mm -hmm. Mamma Lucia. My mom is Lucia too. And, uh, you know, all the time when <laughs> Every I... Every Sicilian when I, mother is yeah. Lucia. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, in, the, in Cavalleria at this moment, it's very, very difficult. And you don't think about uh, other people. But here, when I, I cross and I have the mom, I have to kiss her because it's like my mom, you know. And uh, there are small details, but uh, it, it, uh, it gives uh, life in those uh, performances. It was always very natural in Tokma Cavalleria, but very specific. So the moment that he pauses in front of Lola, that extra moment, and she's looking at him and he's looking at her, and then the pouring of the wine, but they keep looking at one another. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Because it's like this, you know, in real life, you know, yeah. and you can imagine in Sicily, uh, with yeah. everybody looking at everybody. But, yeah. you know, but I put something in the glass, you know. You 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 spoke about the cookbook. Yes. But I made one cookbook, you know, with an, an um, Austrian um, photographer. Mm -hmm. He made a cookbook with a lot of singers, you know, asking them to do a dish, a special dish. And mine was was not a, a dish; it was a soup, soup, but uh, uh -huh. it was a, a, a champagne soup. Why not? And it's amazing. If you have the possibility to try, you have to try. After one glass, you love it. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about Elena Zilio, the woman who played Mama Lucia, is a wonderful 
singer named Ellen Azilia. We've not seen her in America. She, I see her a lot in London. She's very appreciated there. She's 80 years old. Yeah. And the voice is perfect. And uh, she, I heard her a few years ago, they were doing Andrea Chenier in London, which is one of my favorite operas. And Jonas Kaufman was singing Chenier. And she played La Vecchia Madelone, the old mother who's given away the last of her sons to the war, to the cause. And it's a very brief and scene. And she stole the show. She stole the show. <laughs> it's true. From Jonas Kaufman. She did. I mean that. Without trying to steal the show. But she has that much presence. But you know, I sang the same production yeah. l- last year with mm-hmm. her. And yeah. she stole the she show. Stole the show. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but in working with her on this opera, where you, you have actually a longer scene together, because yeah. in, in Chenier, she has her own yeah, moment. Exactly. But in this opera, where she's your mother, um, and Mamma. The last a aria, it's yeah. between her and me. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Quel vino e generoso. Yeah. What was it like creating a, the performing bond with when her? You have, when you have a, a singer and an, an actress like her, mm-hmm. it's very easy. Yeah. You know? And the, in this production, it was uh, amazing because uh, during the, the um, intermezzo, uh, Mamma Lucia comes to see uh, the, the body, the death body of uh, uh, Turiddu, mm-hmm. and she cried. Uh, and she was amazing mm-hmm. because it was uh, real, you know? And after that, sometimes it's quite difficult to sing. It's easy to, to act, but not easy to sing because you have something in your throat mm-hmm. and uh, difficult after that to sing, you know, this uh, last uh, aria. But uh, I think uh, in, in the same time, we are very, very lucky when we have this kind of uh, partner. It's amazing. So we have wonderful singers at the Met, but if the casting gods are watching tonight, as you often do, Elena Zilio, we really Elena would Zilio, like yeah, to yeah. see her. Watch her. She's quite special. Um, so now from a CD, we are going from a Sicilian character <laughs> to Sicilian music. Um, Roberto's mother, your family, is from Siracusa. My mom from Siracusa and mio padre Mazzara del Vallo. Yes, your company. company. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I think if I understand correctly that you've chosen to do a lot of your Sicilian singing with a... Siracusa accent. Sure. And it's mine. <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> you know, if we talk about accents in Italy, we might say si. Southern Campania. But if you go to Sicily, there's Siracusa, Palermo, exactly. Tropani, Messina. They're all different accents. Even words. Even different yeah, words. Yeah, different but to words. To say the same thing. It's, it's amazing. So Roberto made a recording called The Sicilian. And it's full of wonderful Sicilian music that is not necessarily operatic, but it doesn't matter. Because typically, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, we know of folkloric Italian music, it's Neapolitan. But the Sicilian repertory is quite wonderful and less known. And so I'm very pleased that you did an album of Sicilian music. Because Sicilian are more shy than Napolitan. I... <laughs> <laughs> I won't get into that stay one. Quiet. Okay. I live in Liguria. <laughs> um, so, Julian, if you would play number eight, please. <laughs> Desiderio mio e chi stucca 
pioggia Sicilia mia Eh, opera is beautiful ma le canzoni siciliane ancora più belle <ride> Sir Giul- grazie grazie mi fa piacere ho, senti- ho visto anche la-, la ragazza qui che cantava siciliana sì <ride> ma eh, si vede Giul- <ride> eh, e poi sta canzone proprio una cosa tocca il cuore usaccio usaccio la ah, stessa cosa per me uguale eh, mi metto a piangere <laughs> you got it. So, <laughs> grazie, you, signor. Grazie. Were you all reading the subtitles of this lady's conversation? <laughs> that she's Sicilian and, and he does honor to Sicily and it made her cry. And so, on. What, what Roberto saw and I saw was all the heads in the audience were going like this. <laughs> For three minutes and 19 seconds, we saw this. <laughs> which was nice. Julian, set up number 11, please. Um, obviously, this music touches hearts. Yeah. And what is it in that? Because it's the music from the ground, you know, from la, 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 la musica della terra, non so, la, la, la base della musica. E poi il siciliano sono un po' grande così. E poi, è vero, questa è la cosa vera. E non, e non si vanta, mai. <laughs> non si vanta. Bravo, ma questo non lo diciamo, non lo diciamo niente. Signora, se mi permetto. <laughs> What she's saying is, and then Sicilians have hearts as big, and he said, but they never brag about it. <laughs> God forbid. Um, <laughs> so, <sighs> I think what I'm going to ask Julian to do is just play number 11 and then we'll, we'll still be in Sicily and then we'll talk after that. So Julian, if you please, number 11. Love. 
So when The Godfather came out, everyone said to me, Freddo, Fred, <laughs> take care of la familia. <laughs> you know, when uh, I had this idea to do uh, this, uh, this CD, in fact, it was because uh, my, um, my, nonna, my grandmother passed away. No? And I said, I have to leave something because it's impossible now for the next generation of the family not to know uh, about uh, our origin, yeah? origin, mm -hmm. and I said to my uh, record company, I would like to do uh, my my next next uh, CD will be Sicilian sound. You sure, Roberto? Yeah, you'll see. And I bring some uh, folkloric uh, uh, recording, and when they they, they heard the, the the CD, say, Roberto, are you crazy? <laughs> you want to do that? I said, believe me, trust me, it will be fantastic. And I will put also the, the um, padrino, you know, the godfather in Sicilian because it's the original. I said, no, no, almost this one in, in Italiano, almeno una. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, for you, I will sing in Italian. But after that, when I met the two in the concert, I sang all the time the two versions in Sicilian and in Italian. And it was funny because nobody uh, trusts in this city, you know, to, to sell this city in France, you know. Sicilian songs, mm -hmm. and we sold one million just in France. Um, one of the many things that distinguishes your artistry, in my view, and I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> is your superb diction, Thank your you. use of language. Uh, I always, when I teach Italian opera, I use Luciano Pavarotti as sort of the gold standard of Italian usage. The only active singer who approximates that and gets close to what Luciano did is Roberto in Italian. But there is no one in French, frankly. Ah, and You have some. <laughs> no, but I mean, I... I I knew Regine Crispin, yeah, and I learned French from listening mm -hmm. to her, in part, and which explains a lot of who I am. And um, so, what I'd like to have us do now, we're going to watch two works in French, and one of them has acting, the other is much more singing. And I want you, in addition to the beautiful singing, to pay attention to the use of the French language. Okay. So I'm sorry, Julia, I didn't tell you, number 12 and number 13. <laughs>
It's so very powerful music. It is. It's amazing. Music. It's amazing. I love. I love to sing that. Julian, set up number fourteen. <laughs> I want you to know that um, I watched seven different versions of you doing this, and <laughs> and I enjoyed it. Not to worry, <laughs> but because I, I love that music anyway. But um, many of you know, if you followed this series, that one of my two favorite composers is Hector Berlioz, and me too. I adore every note that Berlioz wrote. So you saw Elena Garancia here as Carmen. She's now in the Damnation de Faust of the Met. Do go and hear it. It's just, it's an amazing work. And Berlioz took this national anthem of France and orchestrated it magnificently. Sure. And the reason I said I watched this version, I don't know how long it felt to you, it was six minutes and 15 seconds. There is one version that's 15 minutes long. And it's wonderful. And you sang it magnificently. And what Berlioz did, in effect, was create a portrait of the French people by having the children and the mothers and the fathers. It's like Fiddler on the Roof, Wonderful. in a way. Yeah. Just where every member of the family comes in and the choruses arrive and the military and the church, everyone arrives. And then there's magnificent conclusion at the end. This is actually an abbreviated version of that. Yeah, sure, you have 12 verses. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, a small story about this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this half thing. You know? uh, when I was young, my, I had the first the Italian passport, no, till uh, I was uh, 18, mm -hmm. and I received the French pa passport because I was born in France. But my entire life uh, till there, uh, I was Italian, you know. And uh, my father was a wonderful um, worker, you know, and uh, he worked at the Elysee mm -hmm. in in the. Um, the Elysee Palace? Elysee Palace. Their White House. White House, yes. Yeah. 
our white, white yeah. house. And he was obliged all the time, you know, because it was dirty, you know. Uh, he was all, all, all the time obliged to make a low, very, very turn, you know, a bigger mm -hmm. uh, street because nobody has to see him, ah. you know, all the, the ministry, president yeah. and everything. And what an honor for me in that time, you know, to sing that and to receive from the president the the Legion d'honneur, Legion d'honneur, Legion d'honneur, yeah. with my father there, finally, <laughs> at the right place. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Only for that, I was very pleased to sing. Absolutely. <laughs> and but um, talk. Of, well, I want to ask you a question relating to Berlioz, but then about this. Um, the wonderful Sicilian tenor Marcello Giordani died a few months ago, and he was one of my first guests here before we recorded and transmitted as we do now. And he was singing in Berlioz at the Met in Benvenuto Cellini. Yeah, it was and fantastic. And he was using a French expression, la voix mixte. La voix mixte. What is la voix mixte? It's difficult to explain la voix mixte because it's a mixture between head and chest. And uh, and you know sometimes it's better not to explain. Okay, I I, I will tell you another story, very funny story. My uncle Ernesto was a very good tenor, but I think he knew nothing about technique. And uh, I was a child and listening him singing it was amazing because the sound was so powerful, so full of uh, uh, vibration, you mm -hmm. know, brightness. And I asked him, uh, Zio, che cos'è la maschera? And he told me. Say, you know, Roberto, when you sing Pagliacci, Canio, tu ti metti la maschera di Canio. <laughs> Poi quando canti Cavaradossi, tu ti metti la maschera di Cavaradossi. <laughs> it was not that, you know. <laughs> I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and in terms of the usage of language, if you approach something that everyone knows, like La Marseillaise, do you approach it as you would a song that you sang in Sicilian, as something operatic? What is your approach into a work that everyone knows or should know in France? All the time you have to, um, to go through the, the, the expression of the music and why the composer composed in that way. You know, mm -hmm. This is the most difficult to find. And it's very difficult to find the simplicity, the, the essence of the music, of the, the words and everything. In Berlioz, for example, it's very difficult to why. In fact, he was not successful in, during his time because it was too complex. In, he composed for, uh, in um, such many, many, many styles, different mm -hmm. styles. Even in the same area, in one area, you have different styles, uh, two pages after two pages. It's not, never the same style. But why it was like this? I don't know. Maybe it was a um, it was a simple simple guy, very very intelligent because he was a good writer. He was a uh, it was a he made also you know the traité de the orchestration. You know he wrote he, he wrote the thesis for orchestration. on orchestration. And you know it was uh, self taught. Mm -hmm. It was amazing to know that he was self taught playing just guitar. He composed a lot of things because he heard the bird and the, it he catched the the. The, the tema mm -hmm. and uh, this, they are ge genius and it's impossible to explain why composers are so so great it's impossible but we have to to take this music like uh, a gift of God this is the reality mm -hmm. this music it's like a prayer it's like a communion between everybody and you you have to think music in this way it, this is uh, what I love in music even in Sicilian songs, even in pop songs, even in opera, in everything, there are magical vibration uh, directly connected with something there. <laughs> and when it, it's not necessary to explain, you have just to feel that. With that, you think that we're done, we're not, because you know I always save something special for the artist at the end. Um, I found a wonderful video of Roberto. It requires no explanation. Just enjoy it. Eat it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right.
mia ma è maritare Figlio mio, tu dai dare, mamma mia, pensaci tu Se ti rugna ma c'è l'aia, e da vai, e da veni, lo cutello a mano teni Se ci piglia fantasia, o di dia, lo figlio mio Oh mamma, mi voglio marità, oh mamma Mezzo mare, mamma mia, vai in mare dare. Figlio mio, accuda e dare, mamma mia, pensaci tu. Si ti rugna pizzaiola, i da vai, i da veni, e la pizza a mano teni. Si ci piglia fantasia, o pizzolia, lo figlio mio. Oh mamma, mi voglio marità. C'è la luna in mezzo mare, mamma mia, ma è mare d'arri. Figlio mio, accuda e dare, mamma mia, pensaci tu. Se ti rugna la pastare, i da vai, i da veni, lo spaghetto a mano teni. E dico che va bene dormire. Si c'è la fantasia, spaghetti alla figlia mia. Oh mamma, mi voglio marità. Oh mamma, mi voglio marità. Oh mamma, ori ori ora. Mamma la voglio subito che non ne posso più. C'è la luna in mezzo mare, mamma mia, ma è mare d'ari. Figlio mio, a cui dai dare, mamma mia, pensaci tu. Se ti rugno muraturi, tu vai, tu veni, la cazzola a mano teni. Si c'è una fantasia, cazzo lì alla figlia mia. Thank Roberto Alonso. <laughs> you know, you know, I want to explain you this. You know, this video, it's amazing. Because in fact, we were, uh, everybody was in another place, you know? In south of France, I was in Paris, another one was in another place. And we had just the beat in the ears. Solamente. And everybody sang and played with this beat. And it's amazing to see this result. <laughs> It's incredible. <laughs>